Okay. You probably want to see me, right? Rather than see the table. Hare Krishna. Today is uh, Srila Prabhupada's appearance, disappearance day. Um, it is November 18th, 2020. And because it's his disappearance day, naturally, I wanted to speak about his disappearance and what we can learn from his disappearance. And I thought, before we begin, we should sing the song of the departed Vaishnavas. And I'm hoping that we can post it in the chat. And then we could sing it very quickly. This was something that Prabhupada wanted us to sing on the disappearance day of Acharyas. Um, let's try to find the songbook, though. I wasn't, unfortunately, I didn't have time to prepare. I mean, I did, but I didn't. Um, See if I can find it here. Oh, I have it in a very easy to read format. So I'm going to post, see if I can post this in the chat and see if it fits. It's not divided. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So it's in the chat. The only problem is as new devotees come, and right in the chat, we're going to lose it, so you'll have to keep moving back to it. But I thought, um, I'll just sing once through. You can sing along with me. This is a song by Narottam Das Thakur, and he's feeling the separation from various Vaishnavas who have departed, and it's a song of lamentation. And so lamentation is allowed. If we lament over some of a loss, of association of devotees, it actually helps our Krishna consciousness. So that's the idea. So some of you know the melody. We could sing along together. He anilo premadana koruna prachu heno prabhu kotagela charja. Taku Kamora Saruprupa Kahashanatan Kahadhasa Raghunatha Patita Pavan Kaha mora bhatta juga, kaha kabiraj. Eka kale kota gela goranatharaj. Pashane kutibo nata, anale pashibo. Gauranga gunera nidhi kota gele pabo si saba sangira sangi che koilo bila si sangana paya kande narutama da as. So I'll read a brief translation here. Srinivas Acharya Thakur gave Krishna Prema, pure love to everyone. Oh, where has Prabhu gone now? Where are my Sarup Damodar and Sri Rupa Goswami? Where is Sanatan? Where is Das Raghunath, the lifter of the fallen? Where are my Raghunath Bhatta and Gopal Bhatta? And where is Krishna Das Kaviraj? Where did Goranga the great dancer go? I will crush my head with a rock and jump into fire. Where will I find Lord Goranga, the ocean of jeweled-like qualities? 
from being separated from their loving association. And the blissful pastimes of Mahaprabhu and Narottam Das can only cry. When Narottam Das was going to Vrindavan to meet Mahaprabhu, or maybe it was Puri, I think Vrindavan and Mahaprabhu had left. You know, you find this sometimes in, if you read Chaitanya Charitamrita, you'll find sometimes that um, as a devotee is traveling to meet another devotee, that devotee he's traveling to meet will pass away because they're they're walking and it, it takes time. You know, it's a long trip. And uh, and so uh, lamentation in the Sochiti, Krishna says don't lament, so then we think, well, any lamentation is bad. But the idea is that when we're feeling separation from a Vaishnava, we're absorbed in thinking about them and seeing, hearing, thinking about a Vaishnava is purifying. So the separation increases the meditation, and separation increases affection. So in that way, it's welcome. And Srila Prabhupada said, when the spiritual master leaves, the disciples should cry. So in that sense, we can say, if we're not lamenting, then it's not proper. We should be lamenting. We should be crying. If there's no emotion of separation, when one loses one's spiritual master, that's not a good sign. That means the heart is hard. So lamentation for the loss of a Vaishnava is a sign, is a good sign. It's a sign of a soft heart. It's something Prabhupada said we should be doing and we should be feeling. But it's also a blissful feeling because we're remembering that Vaishnava and you can't not but be blissful in remembering that Vaishnava. And even though disappearance is, you know, it's not a happy time. Being born is a happier time than dying. But traditionally, the birth was not celebrated, but the disappearance was celebrated. And the celebration of the disappearance was actually the celebration of his life. Because when someone leaves, then you recount the glories of their life, the wonderful things that they did, the wonderful relationships they had, the many, many stories of, uh, that inspire us uh, from their life. And so when they're so generally they would celebrate the disappearance day because that was that was at the point when they've lived their life and now you would recount their activities so that was a tradition the birth was it's like you're just born of course you've you've born and you've left now we can talk about you but the idea was the disappearance was actually the main celebration because you were celebrating the glorious life uh, that the person had and the, the the beauty of Vaishnavism is that even though there's separation, there's also meeting in remembrance. And as Prabhupada said, he's present in his books. He's present in his service. So in that sense, we're never really separated from Prabhupada, although you may be feeling separation or feeling that, well, I never met Prabhupada and I would have loved to meet him and feeling separation in that way. But in another sense, being in his service and having his instructions and association of devotees, we don't feel separation. And I think it's important to note that even devotees who had Prabhupada's association would often say that they feel as close to Prabhupada in his service and in hearing from his books or hearing the recorded lectures, conversations, morning walks. And some would even say, I feel closer in his service and I feel closer reading his books or as close uh, as I were when I was sitting in front of him listening. Or they may say, I feel closer because at that time they were young devotees and maybe even though they were sitting in front of Prabhupada. They're actually feeling in some sense more distant than they do today. And one of, the, one of the things that the leaving of the spiritual master forces the disciples to do and forces the grand disciples, naturally forces the grand disciples, is to understand his life and his teachings better than what we understood when he was present. When, he is, when I was thinking this morning that when Prabhupada was present, he created a bubble. And that bubble was like 
it was like a transcendental bubble. And you would join ISKCON, you just get in the bubble. And once you're in the bubble, you feel, in a sense, invincible in that Sangha of devotees in his temple, in his mission. Uh, Prabhupada's presence was so powerful that that it was like mub, that bubble protected us from everything. And what we realized after Prabhupada left is that Prabhupada, because he kept us in that bubble, there were problems outside the bubble that we hadn't addressed or weren't even aware of or maybe slightly aware of. But we hadn't personally had to deal with a lot of those because in Prabhupada's presence, just his words and the power of his presence would vanquish or seemingly vanquish these problems or put these problems off our radar. We didn't even notice them, although they may be there. We were so inspired that So inspired that it was just like we we were in a sense oblivious, and and everything was just simple because Prabhupada was telling us do this, don't do that, and it was all simple, and it was like not that we didn't have to think for ourselves, but we didn't have to overthink, because if there was any issue, uh, or anything we were doing wrong that Prabhupada became aware of, he would correct it, or Prabhupada saw he would correct it. And so constantly things were being kept on the path because Prabhupada was always correcting and always teaching. We were always listening. So we were like in a very safe bubble. Then when Prabhupada left, we, we didn't have that aspect of the bubble. We had other aspects. We had the Sangha. We had his books and so forth. But that aspect of, of just being always directed, quote-unquote, sedantically, always directed on the path, no confusion, everything was always being clarified. After Prabhupada left, now it was up to us to understand it more deeply because Prabhupada understood it deeply, so to speak, that we didn't have to understand it deeply. Not that he didn't want us to, but I think you understand what I'm saying. It's like your father's always there, and it's okay, we're going to do this, we're not going to do that. And you say, okay, that makes sense. And it's kind of like you think you understand it, but then you realize, well, if he wasn't there, or you don't realize it until he leaves, after he leaves, then you think, well, what should we do in this situation? And you try to think, well, what did he do? And then you're confronted with a situation that's different. He never confronted that situation. And you start having to go to his book. Well, what did he teach you about this? And you start discussing it. And then all of a sudden, things which seem to be quite simple and straightforward we're not, and you're, you're realizing, oh, I have to understand this philosophy deep, more deeply. I have to understand Prabhupada more deeply. I have to understand his mission more deeply. I have to understand his example more deeply. So it forced us to do that, and we're still doing that, and it's not as easy as when Prabhupada is here. And you know, you've heard classes sometimes, someone will say something in a class, but another person will say something which is slightly different or the application is slightly different, or it may be much different. And it's confusing. Oh, who's right? What's right? Maybe maybe they're both right. Maybe one is more right than the other. It, these are things which we are exploring today, even at so many years after Prabhupada has left. There's so many questions, and there will be so many more. And so the disappearance of Srila Prabhupada you could say forced us to grow up, forced us to understand the philosophy better, forced us to take res responsibilities that perhaps we wouldn't have taken or didn't have to take because Prabhupada was bearing the burden. So that's the that's the benefit. You know, it's hard to say. You know, it doesn't sound right. You say the benefit of your spiritual master leaving, but there is benefit, and I think the other benefit which the Prabhupada disciples would say is that they feel closer to Prabhupada. And, and why do they feel closer? Because when Prabhupada was here, if your closeness was based on physical proximity, then most of the devotees wouldn't get it for more than a few days a year, and some not, not even get it at all. But now that Prabhupada's gone, your, your physical proximity is impossible. The proximity must be spiritual. So it has to come through studying what he taught, understanding it better, and it has to come through service. Whereas we could we could get it in, in by his personal association, 
or by hearing what he's doing in real time. And now we, there's no real time activity. It's all been done. There's no new instructions. They've already been given. So now we have to find our association with Prabhupada in what we could say more real ways, more genuine ways. His instructions, his mission, what does he want us to do, his service. What is the Siddhanta that he taught? What is his mood? What is his understanding of these various topics? And so by doing that, we feel that we're, we're going more deeply into Prabhupada's heart. His heart by heart, I mean in this scenario, in this context by heart, is what was his desire for us, for the world, for, for the non-devotees, for ISKCON? And what was the Siddhanta that he was representing? Well, he represents Rupa Goswami. He represents disciplic succession, his spiritual master. And then he adapts it, twists it, applies it to the present context. And then we understand, okay, here's the Siddhanta. This is how Prabhupada applied it. Why did he apply it this way? Uh, Rupa Goswami says this. Jiva Goswami says that. Prabhupada says this. Is this. What does he mean? Why is there an amalgamation? Or is he, is he focusing on... Uh, something one acharya said because uh, why because we have to find out so these are these are things that we do now which i think all the disciples of prabhupada will say that has brought me closer to understanding who prabhupada was and is so that's the so i don't think i don't think on in our lamentation on the disappearance of srila prabhupada or any spiritual master it should be a full-blown lamentation. But I think it should also be this huge celebration of how uh, Prabhupada, his, his presence is accessible, and perhaps even more deeply as we mature in Krishna consciousness, even more deeply than he is present. Because, you know, we were young devotees with Prabhupada, and, you know, we didn't understand a lot. And we understand more now. So in that sense, we say, I'm closer to Prabhupada now, closer to his mission, closer to what he taught, closer to be able, be, being able to serve him more or better than I was when he was here. That's, that's definitely at least a potential possibility and a real, I would say a reality for most devotees. That is the reality they live in. So I think it's important to, to balance both the lamentation the, the great loss on our lives and the great loss for the world and all of you who never met Prabhupada lamenting that you never saw him why, you know, why? Um, I missed him Since some of you were alive and old enough to become devotees and you weren't ready and that's a great lamentation that Prabhupada may have come to your city you could have seen him and you didn't that's a, something to lament about for sure but but there's the other side. There's the, the fact that he hasn't left. A little while back, I, I told something that one devotee explained that I really liked. He had joined ISKCON right at the time, right, I believe right around the time Prabhupada was leaving or had just left. And he was feeling... You know, this intense separation that Prabhupada has left, left. And we all felt that. And this was, these, was, these were the words we used. Now that Prabhupada has gone, now that Prabhupada has left. So he said, about seven years later, I, I forget what prompted this realization. Probably he was delving more deeply into Prabhupada's books and teachings. And he said, I stopped using the word left. And I kept saying, I kept thinking to myself and using and talking about Prabhupada in the present tense, talking about his teachings in the present tense. Prabhupada says here in Bhagavatam, Prabhupada says here, the present tense, Prabhupada is, or you could say, on a morning walk, Prabhupada is saying, because to say on a morning walk, Prabhupada says, you would naturally think past tense because it happened in the past. He wanted to bring everything in the present because he said, it just became obvious to me that Prabhupada is here through his teachings and to use the past tense, 
puts puts everything in the wrong perspective. And then we get in this mood, oh, Prabhupada's not here. I wish I had would have had his association. If he were here, I would, have be, I would be a better devotee, things like that. And it struck me as, this is perfect. Let us talk about Prabhupada in the present tense, because that's what Prabhupada said. The spiritual master lives forever, and the disciple lives with him by following his teachings and engaging in his service. So if we speak of Prabhupada in the present tense, I think that will help us tremendously, and it's also accurate. It aligns with what Prabhupada said about how to associate with the spiritual master. Now, I believe it's the fourth canto. Prabhupada is describing a little bit about the disappearance of the spiritual master. And you could just say he's getting us ready for it. And he said, when the spiritual master is present, you should associate with him if you can. Vapu, Vapu means the body, you should associate. Obviously, if you can get the association of your spiritual master, take it. It's invaluable. And then when he leaves, you associate through the instruction. And then Prabhupada said something, which I know is, is really difficult for devotees. And they don't like, I mean, not everybody, but a lot of devotees don't like to hear this. It just, it doesn't, it hits them in the wrong way. So in that purport, Prabhupada said, but of the two, the instructions are more important, or the instructions are better. No, of the two kinds of association, association through vani, words, is better. And so our experience is, no, it's better when I'm with my guru. When I'm with my guru, I feel Krishna conscious. I feel inspired, much more inspired, much more Krishna conscious. And I just love to hear, and I can inquire from him. And I know he's my well-wisher. I know he's praying for me. As you can list 108 reasons why you appreciate the vani of your spiritual master. And Prabhupada is saying, excuse me, 108 reasons why you, experience, you, you appreciate the physical presence of your spiritual master. And Prabhupada is saying, the vani is better. That, that goes against our experience. It goes against our, our even common sense. So we have to understand what did Prabhupada means. So he went on to explain. The reason it's better is because you can't always have the physical presence, but you can always have the instruction. And the instruction, whether it's coming directly from him or being heard on a recording or read on a page, it's as valuable as when he spoke it personally. It's, it's no less potent and no, no less relevant. If it were less potent and re less relevant, then Prabhupada wouldn't say that Vani is better. So I think that's a very simple point, common sense. You don't always get the Vani, but you always, you don't always get the Vapu, but you always get the Vani. And also Prabhupada said, a mosquito is sitting on the lap of the guru, but it doesn't, it doesn't mean the mosquito is close to the guru, and then Prabhupada said, and the mosquito is biting the guru. So you you know you have the by being close to the guru, you have opportunity to offend the guru. So those two things, just by being close, doesn't mean close physically doesn't mean you're actually close spiritually. Being far physically doesn't mean you're far physically. And by being close, yes, it's special, and you also have excellent opportunity to offend your guru by being close, and. Prabhupada used to quote a verse or a saying. I don't, I don't know where it's from. That um, the deity and the guru you should see from a distance, so you don't offend them. So uh, I'm not saying that devotees who were close to Prabhupada offended him, but it's just a caution. So one time Prabhupada was leaving. I believe he was leaving to go somewhere, leaving a temple. And he told the devotees, he said, actually, separation is better, because that's our philosophy. Separation is higher. It's, more, it's a more intense emotion, which leads to more intense meditation and more intense feelings. That's why separation is better. It's more painful, but that pain creates more intense devotional feelings, more intense meditation. So it, it's only painful, apparently, but that pain is sweet. 
there's a kind of sweet pain. And that sweet pain is compared to a very hot chutney, but it's very sweet and very delicious. And it's so hot, it's practically impossible to bear. But at the same time, at the same time it's so sweet, you cannot, eat, you cannot not eat it. So separation is like that. And, and as you understand separation and as you experience it, as you mature, you'll find that the sweetness is what predominates, not the pain. And the pain, so-called pain, is actually the foundation of the sweetness. And when you experience that, then the lamentation of separation is lessened. So Prabhupada was leaving and he said separation is better. Nobody wants to hear that. Nobody, nobody even believes it. Even though we know it's true, it, it's so many of us, no, it's not better. We'll just know when I'm with my spiritual master, that's the best. Separation is not better. And I wish I would have had Prabhupada's physical presence. Now all I have is a separation. How can that be better? As we progress in devotional service, then we realize it is better because, the, because if the separation enables you to get closer to your spiritual master, to be more absorbed in, in thinking of him and serving him, then it's better if it produces a better result. So Prabhupada's point is it will produce or it should produce or it can produce. So we have to allow that separation to produce a better result. And the, the, uh, we're talking about Prabhupada here, of course, but this is also applicable to all of you because it's unlikely you're going to leave your body before, unless you're very old, it's unlikely you'll leave your body before your spiritual master leaves his body. It's more likely you will leave your body, correct? So um, you will leave your body first. So... So what we're discussing today in relation to Srila Prabhupada, it's applicable to you because it's most likely that you, you already are, are, are living in separation from your guru. He's already left. Or at some, some point in your life, you will. And um, it, it's initially very, very difficult. So I was leaving Mayapur. Some of my disciples were escorting escorting me and I told them because I just heard a lecture or read it and, and I, I was referring to what I had just read I said when Prabhupada was leaving he said separation is better than physical presence and as soon as I said that the, all their faces went from this to this well it wasn't like this It was they were pretty sober and all their faces it was like a curtain just closed and it all went like that. Like, why did you say that? How could you say that? That's so insensitive. We don't want to hear that. You're leaving. We feel we, we, we don't want you to go and you're saying it's actually better. That, that's like a, it's like a knife in our heart. It's like someone says, I love you, and you say, no, nah, I don't love you. I don't really care about you. You know, I don't even care if you die. It's kind of like, that's how I felt they took it. Like, that was so insensitive. And, and it just proves how difficult it is to, to digest that. So what I'm saying is that, that we have to be able to digest it. We have to be able to understand it. Because it's true. And maybe it'll take decades and decades and decades of meditation of absorption in service, absorption in instruction by Srila Prabhupada to fully, fully appreciate those statements that separation is better. That we're, we're actually, we actually become stronger in separation because we have to be. It's, it's like, it's, it's absolutely necessary that we become stronger. You have no choice because if you, because without the presence of Prabhupada, the presence of your spiritual master, you'll die if you don't take shelter of their instructions. But when they're present, they can always knock you on the head with a WhatsApp message or with a lecture. And go, I, I really needed to hear that lecture. And so you want to hear it because it's live. It's real time. 
But then when they go, you know, life comes, and you get busy, you're not hearing, you're slipping away, you can't write them a letter and tell them and get an instruction that's applicable to your present situation. So you really, you really have to go more deeply in their instructions. And when you do, then your realization is, oh, I'm getting even more out of their instructions now because if I don't get more, I'll die. But when they're present, it's kind of like this, they put the, they're the wind behind my sails. So I just, you know, I'm always getting this wind. But now that they're departed, their wind is coming through the instructions and I have to understand them. Now there is one thing that's extremely difficult that we all have to learn how to deal with and in the separation of the guru. And Prabhupada had to deal with it also, and Prabhupada actually wrote a poem about this. And his poem was, he was watching, he had, he had as many of his godbrothers did, they had to witness something very painful after the departure of their spiritual master, which was the dissolution of the unified Gaudiya Math, which broke up, the Gaudiya Math remains, but much of it broke up into different organizations. Um, due to infighting. And for most of the devotees in Gaudiya Math, there was nothing they could do about that infighting. It, just, it was just happening. And so many left in disgust. Some took sides. There were two divisions, two factions. Some took sides of one. Some took sides of the other. So that's two divisions. But many, many felt both sides were wrong. And so, out of disgust, they just went and started their own temples, own organizations. So it fragmented. And th the obvious result of that fragmentation was the, the power that they had as a unified movement was diminished. And they weren't, their preaching was not the way it used to be. And so Prabhupada and all of them saw that, and it was very lamentable. And so Prabhupada actually wrote a poem about that. Biraha Ashtaka. Biraha means separation. Ashtaka means eight, asht, eight stanzas of separation. And I don't have it memorized, but one, what stood out, what stood out in the poem, and this may be in every, every stanza, it, this may be expressed, but what stood out to me is that Prabhupada was, was feeling great pain in seeing the mission of his spiritual master, the condition of the mission of his spiritual master. And that intensified his separation. So, <clears throat> how do you deal with that separation? Because we also feel that <clears throat> ISKCON is a different movement than it was when we joined. And there are many things that need to come closer to Prabhupada. Um, we could go down a whole list, you could think of so many things. But the general idea is that without Prabhupada's presence, some, some misunderstanding would arise, some, some deviation, slight or large, would arise. We have to understand, are we deviating? If so, how do we get back on track? Why, and and some, in some places, uh, things go a certain way, and, and nobody really can change it. It's, just, it's built in the culture. It's built in the way... Um, People do things in that country. It's built in the way the managers lead. It's built in the way their spiritual master is preaching. And it's just, this is how it is. And some people may think, well, it doesn't seem that that's exactly the way Prabhupada would want to do it. And, and if you think like that, it's very difficult. So the, and a lot of devotees do think that way. They'll, they'll look at ISKCON and say, like, you know, it's not, exactly, it's not exactly the way Prabhupada wanted this or that. And they may be right. Or they may be wrong. And even if they're wrong, still, even if they're wrong, still they think they're right and they have to look at it and say, this is not what Prabhupada wanted. So, you, so your, your feelings of, of separation from Prabhupada are intensified by seeing things that you believe are not exactly the way Prabhupada wanted them. It's not that everything is not the way Prabhupada wanted it, but you will find things. It's, I don't know if, you know, when Prabhupada was here, we didn't do it this way, or when I joined, it was different. 
Or Prabhupada wouldn't like this. It could be anything. It could just be like today, like when we do um, Prabhupada's appearance day and we sing Guru Puja at noon. There's actually a certain melody you're supposed to sing. Where's that light coming from? There's a certain a certain melody you're supposed to sing. Or, you know, you'll think, well, when Prabhupada was here, we sang that melody. Now this devotee's singing another melody. Not not like the end of the world. But often Prabhupada disciples will say, Oh, but we never did that when Prabhupada was here. Why are we doing it now? And sometimes it's an improvement. And sometimes it's something we find out later Prabhupada didn't want that. But you have to live through that. And that's where you feel the most separation, or when your god brothers and god sisters aren't getting along, the same ones that got along when when your spiritual master was present and now they're not getting along. It's hard. So that's where the most intense separation comes, is when you see the institution, the establishment, or the teachings of the guru being mishandled. So what do you do? Well, you do what Prabhupada did. What, did, what was Prabhupada doing in coming to the West? He was not, you know, some people think he was coming to establish ISKCON. He was actually, his, his desire was to establish a branch of the Gaudiya Math, his spiritual master's mission, because his spiritual master wanted Gaudiya Math to preach in the West. And so, what was he doing? He was, he was coming here, taking a foothold, the seeds were starting to sprout, and he was writing his God brothers, come, let's do this. This can be a branch of your Gaudiya Math. Come, come over here, we need you. Let's strengthen the Gaudiya Math. And, and always Prabhupada was trying, trying to get God brothers to preach, trying to get them to go out, leave India, come to the West, trying to get them to do that, because that's what Srila Bhakti Siddhanta wanted so much. So he was always trying to unify them, even after he started ISKCON. He said, come, help me, I'll give you men, facility. I'll maintain your temples, help me preach. He was always, that was, that was what Bhakti Siddhanta wanted. So he was trying, trying, trying. And then he saw, it. he did the point, he said, this, they're not going to help. So I'll start my own organization. So, you know, we think, some of us may think, well, that was Prabhupada's intention. I think if you look at the history, that was kind of like the last resort, not the first. Not the, not the original intention, but the last resort. Okay, they're not going to help. And this is not going to work. We'll start our own organization. And in starting ISKCON, it, 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 was, it was in a way, it was a way that Prabhupada could, you, you could say, so to speak, make up for the breakdown of the Gaudiya Math and to... to heal that separation that he saw, then he could create another movement that would fulfill the mission, which was preaching all over the world, because that's what Bhakti Siddhanta wanted. So, you know, you could say, in one sense, Prabhupada starting ISKCON was a means of relieving the feelings of separation from his guru, because he was doing exactly what his guru wanted. He, you know, instead of looking at a mission who, who wasn't doing everything their guru wanted, and, and starting to diminish and lamenting, he went out and started another mission to fulfill that desire and make it happen. So how does that relate to us? Well, if we see things in ISKCON that we think are not proper, we should do something as far as possible. We can't always do something. We may not be in a position. Uh, in that case, we can talk to people in positions that we think can do something and say, can you do something about this? This needs to be this needs to be rectified, or this new program needs to be established, or this other program I think should be stopped, I don't think it's proper, can we discuss it? So, uh, and you also individually, you may say, but I'm a young devotee, I don't know all these things. Okay, then be an example, as, as far as you can understand what Prabhupada wanted, be an example of that. And try to make, try to make ISKCON better, because uh, unless ISKCON becomes better, the feelings of separation from Prabhupada will always be dangling over our heads because we think, you know, well, I heard from Prabhupada disciples that Iskan was different when Prabhupada was here, and now it seems uh, like this and that. We're neglecting this and that. And you'll even feel separation 
from Prabhupada even more intensely. He said, I wish I was in that movement, you know, when Prabhupada was here. Of course, when Prabhupada was here, it was not all peaches and cream, and there are many things that are much better now. So I don't want to make it a one-side story. It, it's true, there's so many good things in ISKCON that we didn't have when Prabhupada was here. So I'm just focusing on things that may have gone astray, slightly off track, or very off track, um, or any problem that's going on that, that you could do something to, to help, to solve, just do something. That, that you should do, and that will help you. Otherwise, that kind of separation, that's where it's most intense, when you see you see the energy, the camaraderie, and so forth that was going on during Prabhupada's time. That you know, God brothers leave Iskon, they start their own movements, they start fighting with Iskon. It's very, very painful. It it all just reminds you, yeah, Prabhupada is gone. This wouldn't have happened. This was not happening. Well, it happens a little bit, but not much. Prabhupada kept us together. We all knew that we may not be able to get along, but but because of Prabhupada, we can get along. So we knew that. And we also we also had very ominous visions of the future in Prabhupada's separation uh, without him. So when things, when we had problems, it's almost like we expected it because we knew that an ISKCON without Prabhupada was going to be problematic. And it's still problematic. And if Prabhupada were here, he could resolve, he could resolve issues. The new things are always coming up. Uh, and how, what do we do about this? What do we do about that? Well, those are things we didn't we we didn't have problems with. You know, how uh, how do we deal with old age? What do we do with retired devotees? So where do we bury devotees? Do we have a place for all the Prabhupada disciples to bury them? Um, do all gurus get samadhis? All these questions. We didn't, those were not questions when Prabhupada was here, and so many other questions. You know, what about the second generation? Um, they're they're forty years old. They're like so many of them are forty plus, and um, reflecting on that and reflecting on the second generation now, the ones being born, the twenty year olds. You know, we didn't have that. There was no nothing to reflect on. So many things to reflect on, uh, we couldn't reflect on. So these are things that we all should be doing, in some way, being good examples strengthening ISKCON, understanding Prabhupada. And you may say, well, I don't understand all these things. Well, you sh should learn. Read, 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 read. Read about Prabhupada. Read what he did, read what he said. You'll start to understand what he expects of you, what he expects of ISKCON, and then you can contribute. I once heard, I think it was Bhakti Tirtha Maharaj who said something that really struck me. And I don't, I think he was quoting someone. And the quote was something to the point of if you want to glorify someone, create a community which is based around their teachings. They have a community in India, I believe it's South India, called Oroville. Oravinda. There was a guru named Oravinda. I believe his name is Oravinda. Oravinda? Oravinda. So they created a town called Oroville. I'm assuming based around what he was teaching. Uh, you have Gita Nagari, the, the, the village... Uh, where the, the Gita is sung, or the village where you live by the Gita. So that's the idea. So to, to honor Srila Prabhupada, to glorify Srila Prabhupada, we live by his teachings. When we went to India in 1975, Prabhupada said, if you behave properly, people will see your behavior, they will appreciate it, and that will be a glorification of me because they will understand you your behavior is is so nice and therefore you must have a spiritual master who is very very pure and so they will appreciate Prabhupada said they will appreciate me not that Prabhupada wants to be appreciated but they'll by appreciating him they'll appreciate what he's doing they'll want, then they'll want to become part of ISKCON they'll you know, any appreciation of ISKCON is good and good for us and good for them. And so your your behavior 
people see your behavior, indirectly it glorifies your spiritual master. Your ill behavior, indirectly, it, it minimizes the glory of your spiritual master, if that's the way we can put it. At least it, it's, it's a mark against you. And that's there in the Bhagavatam when Jai and Bijai were having a, a tussle with the, the Kumaras, Chatursana, the four Kumaras, the Lord Vishnu came out and apologized. And Prabhupada said that if a servant misbehaves, it's, it's a blemish against the master. And vice versa, if he behaves well, it's a, it's a glory to the spiritual master, to the master. So one of, the, one of the best ways to glorify Prabhupada is to exemplify what he taught. And that's, so I think that's something we should get. Um, that's something we should get today or meditate on today, for sure. I want to I say one more thing, and then we'll uh, take your questions and comments, and then we'll see how much time we have. And then, if there's more time, I may read something. So this morning, I was reading from a book. I, I think it's a book, yeah. Um, what was the name of the book? Hold on a second. I'm going to go to that file. can't even find it. How was I reading from it if I can't find it? Oh, it would, must have been on the folio and I got rid of it. So th it was a book by, it was by Tamal Krishnamaraj. And it was called, uh, I guess, The Last Pastimes of Prabhupada. If I go back in my folio... Yeah. not helping me. It's just, <laughs> I go back, I'm just getting more. Oh, this is interesting. Anyway, it was, uh, I'll try to find it again. There's a book. Yeah, Prabhupada's Final Days. I was reading from that, and I, it started, uh, I went to November. This book covers February through November. So I went to November and I read through up to November 4th. And there was a switch. Um, the Prabhupada was eating a little bit. And then, um, and then he was saying, I can't eat anymore. And then just drinking a little barley water. So it's, it's evolving to this point. He's not taking solid foods. And eventually, he stops eating. So now we're like two weeks, November 4th, 13, 14 days before Prabhupada left. And what's happening is every day is becoming weaker. You can see a, when you read from November 1st, you, you can see he's a little stronger. But by the 3rd or 4th, he's so weak, he, he doesn't have strength. Can you imagine how weak this is? This is inconceivable. He doesn't have strength to sit up. So to sit up, he has to be pulled up. And so he has to uh, imagine he doesn't have strength to hold himself up. And he's becoming um, discouraged. Kind of, you can see the thinking is, well, what's, what's the use now? I, I, my body's not working, so wh why, why should I bother you all? You have to take care of me. I'm just a burden. So he kept... Prabhupada kept saying, you know, I'm just a burden. And sometimes uh, later he said, I'm just a bag of bones. You know, so, um, so there was this feeling like, why maintain the body? I can't do any service, and I'm just burdening you. And, and as I was reading, I was thinking, okay, by reading these last days, you can read it if you have the Veda base. You go into other books by Srila Prabhupada, and then you go into this book. TKG's diary, Prabhupada's final days. And if you don't have it, I think you can just access it online. 
database. It's called the database. Go into database. Go into con I don't know online if it's exactly like this, but you go into database. You go to contents, and then you go down the contents, and you'll see other books by Srila Prabhupada. Then you click on there's a there's like a plus sign. You click on it. It opens up all the books, and then you'll see TKG's diary. And then if you click on the plus sign there, then you'll get all the chapters. I think maybe not. I think when you go in, you just click on it, you go in, and then you will see the chapters. You can click on a chapter and it will take you there. So I'm seeing this, this mood of Prabhupada, and, I'm, and as I'm reading it, I'm remembering what Prabhupada said. He said, you know, don't think you won't have to go through this. Of course, obviously, we will have to. But what was the... You know, what was the message? Well, the message that a lot of devotees got was Prabhupada is teaching us how to leave our body. And even if that was not the conscious message Prabhupada was giving, if Prabhupada was just giving the message, don't think you'll stay young forever, which, of course, we were thinking, because Prabhupada was like 50, 50... Prabhupada, Prabhupada was 54 years older than me. Yeah, 1896. So he was 54 years. So that's like, that's like grand. 54 years. You could be your grand. Your grandfather is like that old, or maybe slightly older. But um, if you if your grandfather and your father ha gave, you know, had you when had him and you when they were in their early 20s, then 54, you would be 54 years younger than your grandfather. So, I was 27 when Prabhupada was leaving. At the age of 27, 54 years is a, is a long time. And so, death is not something you think about when you're that young. So Prabhupada's just reminding us. But the message, the message that we got was... Prabhupada setting an example for us. Like I'm saying, whether Prabhupada intended, intended them, intended us to be aware of the example or not by that statement, one thing we understand is Prabhupada was Acharya, so he was always setting the example. And he, he was conscious of being Acharya. Of course, his life is an example. He's always setting an example. He doesn't have to think about it. But at the same time, he knows that we follow his example. So he has to be conscious. Uh, he never manifested ecstatic symptoms publicly, and if he did, he apologized. He's conscious of that example. He's conscious what, what he'll do will imitate. And so he didn't, he didn't really do things. He, didn't, he did things we couldn't do, like sleep two hours and so forth. But he really didn't do things he didn't want us to do, generally. So we all got the message that, that Prabhupada's showing us, okay, this is how you leave your body. So that was one lesson. This, like, well, the body's useless. I might as well just die. There's, you know, I'm, and this humility comes out. You're all taking care of me, and I'm just a burden. And he's the spiritual master who saved us all who's more dear to us than anyone could ever be dear to anybody, who's our life and soul. And he's feeling, I'm just a burden for you. Now, you can imagine how the devotees felt when Prabhupada said that. What a shock. Just it's like piercing their heart. And of course they said, no, Prabhupada, we're a burden for you. So Prabhupada actually felt that. That's, that's how he was, his his in his consciousness. And he, if you read this story, you see that he totally realized, he was totally realizing that this body is just his vehicle and the vehicle is ready for the junkyard. That's, you know, it's like when Prabhupada talks about his body, it's like somebody talking about a car that's ready to be put in the junkyard. Or what do we call it now? There's, we don't call it junkyard. We call it something else. 
something about you know reusing. I think junkyard is is not a nice name because the things you buy in the junkyard are usable. So junk is kind of like unusable. But that's what we used to call it. Like the car is old, you know. You get fifty dollars, they tow it off, and they use it for spare parts. So you see the way Prabhupada's talking about his disappearance is kind of like talking about a car that's ready for the junkyard. You can really see that there was no identification and no attachment. And there was the mood was the body's now useless. So I just, you know, stop eating and die. Well, why maintain the body? Of course, the devotees were saying, Prabhupada, you know, we don't want you to leave. Please stay with us. And um, Prabhupada kept saying, I don't think I'm going to make it. You know, he, he sensed that it was the end. And, and as disciples, you know, we would never give up, it, it, you know, do anything, anything, because we thought when Prabhupada leaves, that's like the end of Iskan. We had no idea how Iskan would succeed without him. So you could imagine the intensity of the desire of all of the devotees that were there to, to find a way to get Prabhupada to hang on and be hopeful and take medicines and try to eat and you know, because everyone's sitting there thinking Prabhupada's departure is the end of ISKCON. Of course, we knew we had to go on and we knew we would go on. But part of us is thinking, we have no idea how it's going to work. It's impossible. Of course, we have to do it. But in our mind, we couldn't fathom how there could be an ISKCON without Prabhupada. It's like a, a veggie burger with just a bun. You know, it's like a, you know, what you can think of so many examples. Right now I can't think of any examples other than that. You know, it's it's like, wait a minute, where's where's it's not a veggie burger, there's no there's no patty in here. It's like this and that iskan, there's no Prabhupada here. How could you have an iskan without Prabhupada? That just wouldn't work. Or maybe a, a car without an engine. You know, it's like it doesn't it doesn't work. There's no engine, it's just a body. So we, you know, we were kind of thinking, like, this is just a body without Prabhupada. It's not going to go anywhere. I mean, we we couldn't even imagine what it was like. And so it was just a, it was just this, this sense of Iskan is Prabhupada. There's no such thing as Iskan without Prabhupada. So it was inconceivable to us that Prabhupada wouldn't be with us, at least not for another 20 years till we were more mature. But to leave us now, it was just like, our mind, we, we couldn't imagine that Prabhupada was actually leaving, that his body was getting weaker and weaker to the point where he could hardly eat, he couldn't sit up. It's just like it didn't make sense at all. It's like, what's happening here? He's not supposed to leave. There's not going to be an ISKCON without him. So it, it was like, you know, people ask me, well, how did you feel when Prabhupada left? And it was kind of this we were caught up in two worlds. We were caught up in this world of it doesn't look like Prabhupada's going to make it because, you know, we prayed and prayed and thought and thought he was going to make it. He went to London, I think it was July, and then I think just a week later he came back because he became so ill. And we're praying every day to, to Krishna to extend Prabhupada's life, and he authorized that prayer. So it made us kind of think, well, maybe there's a possibility. And all the other thoughts of there is no Iskand without Prabhupada. But the writing was on the wall on the other side. And it was just a question of when. But it was, as with anyone's death, even though you know it's going to happen when it comes down to it, it's like that's the hard part, even though you've been prepared for it. So when I got the news, it was... It was like, yeah, of course, we knew it was going to happen. We just didn't know when. This week, next week, next month, we knew it wasn't that long because there was no turnaround news. There was no news. Prabhupada's getting better. It was just, he's not eating. He's getting thinner. 
but there's also that shock, like what's what's going to become of me and what's going to become of Iskan without my spiritual master? And I distinctly remember myself feeling, now that Prabhupada's gone, I have to be more Krishna conscious. It was like this huge boost initially. Prabhupada left and it was like, okay, I have to make up for this loss. As best I can make up. And I talked to my God, but everybody felt the same way. It was like, it's like Prabhupada left a space. We all have to fill that space. That's how we all felt. And that's, that's the right feeling. You should feel that way. He's just left this huge space. And so all of us together, we have to fill up that space. And guess what happened? Guess what we realized? That all of us together were having a really hard time filling up the space of one person. All of us together having the knowledge of that one person, the realization of, what, of that one person, the insight of that one person, the inspiration, the determination, the strength, the steadiness, all that. We realized all of us together, we don't have it, at least not when Prabhupada left. And you could say in a sense that since that time, we're still trying to, we're still trying to make up as a, as a group of thousands of disciples, we're still trying to fill up the gap that was left by Prabhupada leaving. But definitely, definitely when Prabhupada left, everybody was feeling, now I need to be more Krishna conscious. My spiritual master is gone. So that was, you could say, you know, maybe, maybe you could say Prabhupada knew everything that would happen. And he knew that until he leaves, the disciples won't step up to the plate. And until he leaves, the disciples who are not genuinely Krishna conscious really taking the process deeply to heart without motivation and willing to make sacrifice. They won't know where they stand until I leave. I think some devotees feel that way. You know, like, what you say, why did Prabhupada leave so early? And you could look at it and say, it was a perfect time. Say, but so many problems happened. So many people fell. We were so young. Yes. But maybe from Krishna's perspective and Prabhupada's perspective, this was the only way that his disciples would step up to the plate and some when they stepped up would hit home runs and some would strike out. And, and it wouldn't have been any different or better 20 years later. Of course, we say it would be because there would be so much of a greater foundation of ISKCON. But maybe it wouldn't be that much different. Maybe once he left, there would be this huge vacuum and maybe we would have never grown as quickly if Prabhupada stuck, stuck around. So it's like, okay, I'm leaving. You, you're going to grow, and some of you will fall on your face, and that's how you're going to grow, and some of you will hit home runs. And, and here we are today. It's still going on by Prabhupada's grace. So back to what was going on when Prabhupada was leaving. Uh, one thing that stood out that was so amazing, and if you read, if you read this, it will stand out for you also. I'm, I began reading November. So Prabhupada left November 17th. So I'm reading 17 days before Prabhupada left. And after a few days, Prabhupada just gives up. He said, There's, I'm not going to live. I, I, he didn't want to eat. He said, what's the use? I can't digest. So Prabhupada had already given up on living. And he knew it was only a few weeks. That, that we can understand. And what's so amazing, what is Prabhupada doing? What is he doing? You can read the conversations. It's devotees telling Prabhupada, in Bombay we're doing this, in Mayapur they're doing that, in New York they're doing this, they're doing the Rathyatra here, they've just published these books, and Prabhupada is commenting on all of that. Prabhupada, this is what's going on in Jagannath Puri, Prabhupada giving his commentary. They should do this, they should not do that. Mm -hmm. What's going on here, there, Mayapur, this, that, this should be done. Or just talking about it. This is what we're doing in Mayapur. This has never been done. Now everyone's appreciating. Tell so-and-so this. Tell so-and-so that. That's what he's meditating on two weeks before he's leaving his body. Just, just talking about, do this, arrange this. Send him here. Tell him this. 
I was reading this and thinking, okay, you know, you're leaving your body. Like, aren't you just supposed to just like, okay, everyone come in my room. No more management. Just read Krishna book, read Bhagavatam, read Bhagavatam Rita, read you know, whatever your favorite book is, have them read it. And when you're not reading, do kirtan. Of course, they were doing kirtan later uh, in the last days for Prabhupada. But as you know, right up to the last moment, Prabhupada was translating. And I was thinking, I was thinking, okay, this, this is something that can't go unnoticed. This is, it's not, you could say it's not even normal that a sadhu on his deathbed is, is, ma is still managing a worldwide movement as if, he's, as, as if he's going to live for another 50 years. Send him here, do this, tell him that, organize this, stop doing this, don't, you know. Like his mind is all over the world organizing the preaching. And he's only got two weeks to live. And you would think, well, you only got two weeks to live. You know, you've kind of done everything. Maybe you should just not think about it. And I was thinking, why is Prabhupada thinking about that two weeks before he's going to leave his body? And what we know and what we can see from this is that Prabhupada cannot not think about things which would help the conditioned souls become Krishna conscious. So when he's when he's talking about send him here, or organize this, do that, really what I was hearing is is Prabhupada's heart speaking. We have to make we have to give Krishna to other people. Do this, more people will become Krishna conscious. Do that, more people will become Krishna conscious. So you really you really see Prabhupada's heart pouring out in 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 that scenario is it's very interesting to read that because naturally you think these are the last days why is he absorbed like that because that's where his heart is he can't not but think about giving krishna consciousness to people so even in his last days he, you know it's like you're leaving and you've turned the move, movement over to the gbc and they're going to do everything so it's like you know you could think from a practical point you don't need to talk about these things because you've handed it over. So it wasn't really, it wasn't, I wasn't picking up on it as something practical. I was just picking up on it as like, this is where Prabhupada's heart is. So he, he can't stop pushing forward because pushing forward means more people will become Krishna conscious. He can't stop thinking about making people Krishna conscious, which shows the depth of his compassion, that it's it's so integ integrated, integral to who he is, that even on his last days, he's thinking about giving people Krishna conscious. There, there's a story that as devotees were coming to meet Prabhupada, he had stopped eating, and they would come to see him, and he would say, did you get prasadam? And all the devotees are thinking, he's not eating, and he's worried about us getting prasadam. So that these things show you what's going on in Prabhupada's heart. His body's falling apart. He's ready to give up on it. He doesn't care anymore. And he's thinking about all the conditioned souls who need to get Krishna consciousness. You know, most people, when they're in that condition, they're thinking, oh, poor me, my body's falling apart. You know, this is so bad. And I don't deserve this. And, you know, you know, give me an operation. Let me live another 10 days. And that was not that was not our Prabhupada. That was not what what you could say. What you saw with him in his life, you saw it all the way to the end. And nothing at, at, regarding the breakdown of his body or leaving his body affected that consciousness. It was totally stable. And then I think that was obvious when um, two things that made this obvious. One. Uh, because Prabhupada wasn't eating, if you see the pictures, you see he became very thin and he would joke, I'm a bag of bones. And one doctor said, it's actually, it's actually because there's no fat in his body, it's, it's just like, it's actually painful, but he's not saying anything. And he said, this is like remarkable because most people can't tolerate it. So it was, it was like just completely aloof 
from the body to be able to tolerate that. And then th the clarity he had to be able to translate even in that condition. It was like, it was like he did not allow that condition to affect his service as far as possible. Of course, he was weak, but he could still be thinking and talking and inspiring people to spread Krishna consciousness. And somehow or other, he had the, I don't know if the word, I don't even think the word clarity is the word I want to use. The, the, what's the word? The body is falling apart. Everything's falling apart. And, the, you know, we say he had the presence to be able to translate. That's, that's like off the charts inconceivable. And every time, every time I see that video or that picture, because it's, 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 I don't like seeing it because it's, who wants to see their spiritual master leaving? But at the same time, when you see it, you can't help but see what that says, that here's this person whose body has fallen apart, who's got the presence to be able to translate, to focus and translate Bhagavatam, and the heart to want to give to his last breath because maybe someone will be helped by the next purport. It's inconceivable. And so I don't think I don't think we can overlook those examples. And of course, there may be so many examples that Prabhupada set by his dying. But those those two things came out to me in reading. Um, that just that extreme aloofness, uh, feeling the body now is a burden, not wanting to maintain it and not wanting to burden other devotees. And that absorption and the spreading of the mission, even in that state. So I'll end for now, and we'll have some discussion, and we'll see how this discussion goes. And then um, after this, I'm going to get off and go on to the Alachua Disappearance Day program and speak something between 10 and 10.30. It'll give me uh, about seven, eight minutes to speak. So Ajayi Nitai says, my father cries remembering Srila Prabhupada and how much enthusiasm he felt as a devotee in those days. Yeah. So, um, this, is, this is something which is probably one of the most difficult things you have to bear when your spiritual master leaves because in the presence of the spiritual master, not just Prabhupada, but all spiritual masters, in their presence, an atmosphere is created, and you you can create a special atmosphere when your spiritual master is gone, but you can't create that exact atmosphere, that specialness. Yeah. I, I was once in Atlanta. Jab Takamar should come. This was long ago, before the stroke, and he was giving initiation. He was lecturing. His disciples were there. And I could see that he, there's just a special mood that surrounds him, that nobody can really create that mood. Only he can create it. You only have it in his presence. And I think that's true for anybody, not just the spiritual master. And that's probably what you just expressed here, Jaini Tai. That's probably the most difficult thing in separation is that you can't recreate that atmosphere because that person's not here and nobody can really imitate it. You know, sometimes you'll meet a very advanced devotee or meet someone that reminds you of your spiritual master and has that mood and you'll say, you know, when I'm in his presence, I feel like I'm in the presence of my guru. That's true. That does happen sometimes. And it does relieve a lot of the separation if, you, if you're in the presence of that person who's very much like your guru. But generally, that's har it's hard to replace your guru. So it's a fact. And, and you know, the, se the separation, the reality of separation is that that kind of separation only happens because you had their association. And you want their association, you benefit from their association, but the downside is because you had it, you suffer when you don't have it because it was special. And it's like, okay. 
or it was a special rasa they had with you, a special relationship when you would serve together, they would make jokes or they would make fun of you or it's just like it's not going to happen. There's no who else is going to do that. Or they chastise you, you say something and they say that was the stupidest thing I ever heard. You know, why don't you why don't you go shopping today and you know, maybe you can go to the brain store and find a brain and you know, you're laughing, they're laughing and you know, who's going to do that with you? Is that was that was their particular relationship. They could do that. Anyone else did that, you'd want to kill them. But they could do that and you just laugh and relish it. Because you know what they're saying is true, that you did something stupid and you need to get a need to buy an upgraded chip for your brain, you know, make it work better. You got the message, you know, I'm not paying attention, I'm not concentrating on what I'm doing. They could do that. It's special. But you think no one no one else could tell me that. I would get upset. I couldn't hear it. So unless you you so that that's just a reality. Not that you wouldn't have six year gurus and have special relationships. You will. You can find a six year guru and have a very and have similar relationships. But but you know that relationship you have with your guru, it was special. The moods that he created, the unity amongst the disciples he created, it may not be exactly the same when he leaves. Hopefully it will be as far as possible. Hopefully the disciples will create continue that mood get together. I see disciples of Bhakti Tirtha they get together, read his books. Disciples of Tamal Krishna Maharaj, just had a big festival, 50th anniversary of his sannyas. They get together, they churn the nectar, they talk about it. I think that's beautiful. It should be done. But, you know, these are realities. And therefore, it is, you know, it's hard. It's it's you know the world when uh, not just the spiritual master but the world when a loved one leaves the world becomes different and what can you do about it and t to the degree that you love them to that degree you suffer and um, it's a fact we suffer in separation but we also have we also appreciate their who they were the examples and so you know. Your guru leaves, but you have this memory of the example he set. You have this memory of the things he said, and your life is all the better for it. And so you remember that in appreciation. And so even though you're lamenting the absence, but you realize, if I didn't have the presence, I wouldn't have the absence. And if I didn't have the presence, I wouldn't have been edified in all the ways that I have been. And so you start remembering what he did, what he said, what you got from him, and then you you feel his presence, and then that way you pacify you you're pacified, and you realize, even though I'm missing him, I ben I have so much of the benefit of what he did, and what he's still doing in his instructions. Okay, so it's true, Ajay. You know, that's that's what I was saying. That Prabhupada's Virha Ashtakam was like a separation of what. Kodiyamath was and what it had become. And Prabhupada was really feeling that we, the Kodiyamath had failed Srila Bhakti Siddhanta and that increased his feelings of separation. And that, you know, we don't have control of that. But we can also be optimistic and look on the bright side of things. And especially we can try to do as Prabhupada did, fulfill the order of Srila Prabhupada to make ISKCON better, more powerful, stronger, pure. And in that way, we will feel Prabhupada's presence more strongly in ISKCON, and then we'll feel less separation from Prabhupada because we're doing something to help get Prabhupada's presence, teachings, center, stage, felt powerfully by everyone in ISKCON. Christina says, uh, I guess that also physical presence doesn't actually mean you are sincerely absorbing the instructions. Definitely not. And the instructions are what is more important. Yeah, because not all the disciples of Prabhupada are doing as well as all as some of the grand disciples. So that that proves. I don't, you know, there there is a lot of emphasis on, you know, how advanced is your guru? Is he a Uttama Bhakta? Who is your guru? Is he the right guru? And of course those those questions are valid. But I don't think Prabhupada put that much stress on it because we have the teachings of all the acharyas, we have all his books and 
I don't think Prabhupada felt that who initiates is really is really the crucial element of your Krishna consciousness. Now, some people say it is. I don't I don't get the impression by what Prabhupada did said um, that it is when he was there. There is a controversy: was Prabhupada appointing gurus or not? And if you read the letters, it's it's pretty clear that he was telling these people, you become guru. And interesting, because Prabhupada appointed a few. He, said, he can do, he can do, he can do. And then Tamal Krishnamaraj, who was the secretary, didn't say, what about me, Prabhupada? He just said, anybody else? And Prabhupada said, all right, he can, he can do, you can do. And you know they were trying to fill up the world with gurus. And and then I think they said, you know, what? well, what about India? Oh, Jab Takamarsh is here. What about there? What about Europe? Oh, Hansa Dutta is there. What about, you know, it was like, it was almost like a pragmatic thing. Okay, they can be gurus in different parts, and then people can take shelter there, which is kind of the establishment, what we call the zonal acharya system, which we saw didn't work. And everyone says, well, you know, Prabhupada established it. But in doing so, it it doesn't seem to indicate that Prabhupada was so was so worried about who is the guru, or if he's not the guru, these people are gurus. It was like a higher principle that that um, you have the eternal instructions of the acharyas and the shastra. You have his books, so we're all. It's all good. We're all in the same boat. You know, you may be in this room. I may be in that room. This is the leader of this room. This is the leader of that room. But we're all in the same boat. When it all comes down to it, you know, everyone in every room is going to get to dock because the boat, because Prabhupada's the captain of the boat. So we're all in different rooms. Prabhupada's the captain of the boat. You're all going to get to the shore. It doesn't matter what room you're in. You might say, well, the temperature in this room is a little nicer than that. I like warm rooms. Well, I like cold rooms. Okay, that's there. So you choose your guru in the cold room. I choose my another one. You choose your guru in the warm room. I'm not trying to deny to deny that that people will naturally be attracted to certain gurus. But it it seems that Prabhupada didn't give it the um, significance that maybe we do. That he gave more significance to the instru the eternal instructions, eternal instructions of the acharyas and the instructions he was giving. He gave significance. At least you're on the boat, that's good. As long as you're on the boat of the disciplic succession, yeah, whatever room, you know? Well, that room's closer to you, so you can go in his room. You're, you're on the other end of the boat? Okay, go in that room. <laughs> okay. So um, that's how he was appointing them, you know? You think appointing gurus by region, hmm, that's interesting. And then he said, you know, more can be gurus. So that's... That's something also to consider, at least to add into the mix of Guru Tattva, of how Prabhupada did it. It wasn't um, long, drawn out, thought out. It's like, yeah, um, my disciples have become Guru, and, you know, okay, any other questions? <laughs> That's basically. Prabhupada said, what about, you know, after you're gone, what about Gurus? So, yeah, I'll appoint some of you. And then, uh, uh, Okay, and then whose disciples are they? They're your disciples, my grand disciples. Okay, okay, next question. It's like, that was it. It's like, why are you asking these questions? You know, it's like, we've been talking about this for the last 12 years in my books. You know, like, I'm not doing something different, you know. The guru, you know, his disciples become gurus. Like, what's the problem? We made it a big thing, and it caused a lot of, we made it such a big thing. No, they all have to be like Prabhupada, and that created havoc. But it seems the way Prabhupada did it was, was kind of like, you know, nothing's going to really change, you know. I, I'm the Acharya, and you're all helping me, and so you can initiate. It's not a big thing. It's not you become king of the hill, and all your god brothers are your serfs, and um, you just put me in a little closet in a museum, and things go on. It's like, no, it just goes on the way it is, you know. I'm, I'm the founder Acharya, and you're just like a student teacher, you know, helping me. But it wasn't like that. And so things got obscured. And the whole concept of guru 
in relation to Prabhupada was was hard to figure out because guru in and of itself is in a very big position. But in in relation to Prabhupada and Iskan was meant to be different. So it seemed that we totally misunderstood it and we wanted to elevate Guru to a very exalted position where Prabhupada was no, he's just just be you what are you? You're a regular guru. They're your disciples. And I was like, okay, what other questions do you have? <laughs> I was like you know, like like Diksha Guru, it's not like, you know, I'm founder of Charya, that's a big thing. But you're just Diksha Guru, it's not a big thing. You initiate disciples into the disciplic succession. You can have thousands of disciples. But the main thing is they're all in the boat, and the boat is the main thing. Your room is not the main thing, the boat's the main thing. Your room is nice, you know, you keep them happy, you keep them fed, you know, it's a long trip on the boat. You make sure they don't get seasick. Yeah, right. So there is importance to your room. But your room, if your room is perfect and the boat sinks, then we're in trouble. So the main thing is the boat. And the boat is not going to sink. So you just keep your people alive and happy so they get to the shore alive and happy. But the boat is doing everything. So I think that's how Prabhupada saw it. And we took it differently. We started to think those 11 are actually 11 boats. They're not 11 rooms on Prabhupada's boat. They're 11 independent boats. And Prabhupada's, you know, like, he's in the museum now. Of course, we use his books and like that, but it was a little bit like, well, maybe these these 11 are relevant, and he's not so relevant anymore. So I don't know how I got off on that. That was an inter There was a reason I said that, but I can't remember why. Does anybody remember why I was mentioned? I'm trying to connect. I, there was definitely a reason that I mentioned that, but I can't remember where I started. We'll have to listen to the recording because there was. Anyway, there was some connection <laughs> somewhere. Um, anyway, let's read a little more your comments, because I can't remember the connection. Um, but may, maybe we can also say, you know, Prabhupada was leaving. It's like, okay, you know what to do. You take your own disciples. Not a big thing. Follow my instructions. Let's just keep going. And um, they started off on the wrong foot. And when you start off on the wrong foot, sometimes it's, it's hard to get back to the right foot because... The right foot doesn't even look right anymore because you've been off for so long, you don't even know what it looks like. And so Iskand is having is having has have has has had since Prabhupada left a little bit of an identity crisis about what the guru what the guru's position should and shouldn't be. And you could say, well, you know, according to Shastra, it's clear, which is true. It is clear. But if we if we take Shastra verbatim and apply it verbatim, it can create problems within a multi guru society. And then it can create problems even where some people think, well, well, this one, he should be the next founder of Acharya. No, sorry, there's only one founder of Acharya. You know, he should just be the humble servant of the founder of Acharya, no matter how exalted he is. And we should all be the humble servants. And we should not try to exalt any guru to some ultimate special status that would seem to be anything other than the humble servant of Srila Prabhupada. We didn't get that. And, and in the wake of that, one of the biggest problems and the biggest tragedies for our movement in the wake of that is was the minimization of the position of Siksha Guru. Because when you minimize the Siksha Guru, Prabhupada's the Siksha Guru. So he naturally gets minimized. It was... and. When Prabhupada's disciples were minimized because the gurus were considered to be everything, and so the disciples, you know, well, you weren't chosen to be gurus, so you must not be so pure as they are. That was the thinking. It, they went simultaneously. Prabhupada's the Siksha guru, minimized. The other Siksha gurus also minimized. The Diksha guru maximized. That's what we ended up with. So now you have one Diksha guru and no Siksha gurus. And whereas you should have many Siksha Gurus who can help you in many different ways. So there was a great loss of that. And we had, you know, we had to talk about it, write books about the Siksha Guru, but it's already in Prabhupada's books. But because we went astray, then, then nobody really understood Siksha Guru 
And we didn't understand it during Prabhupada's time because we really didn't. You know, it really, Prabhupada was so powerful. It's like everything was fine. And um, now things are different. So we're trying to get back to clarify our identity. And over the years, GBCs have said things, written papers, made resolutions to try to clarify more clearly where that track is, where that purpose is. And, and still some devotees say, we have a ways to go. We're not there yet. But um, as we get closer to it, what you find is Prabhupada being more exalted, the Diksha Guru is being more, I don't want to say normal, but for now I'll just say normal. The Siksha Gurus coming up to the level of Diksha Gurus, representative of God, they're also representatives of God. They also take you back to Godhead. So kind of, you know, who, who takes you back to Godhead? Prabhupada? Your Diksha Guru, your Siksha Guru, your temple president, the Bhagavatam, the Sangha, Tulsi Devi, the deities, all of the above. Not just your Diksha Guru. He's important, obviously. You have a special relation, no doubt. But, but can you have a special relationship with the Siksha Guru? Yes. Could you have more of a special relationship with the Siksha Guru than the Diksha Guru? Yes. You, you know, what are we supposed to do? Pass a law? You cannot have a good relationship, a better relationship with your Siksha Guru than your Diksha Guru. You see your Diksha Guru every week. You write him every week. You're working with him. Your Diksha Guru is in a different part of the world. You, you're not interacting with him. Naturally, you're going to have this very strong relationship with your Siksha Guru, maybe even stronger. Can't regulate that. There's nothing wrong with it. We didn't know that in the early days. We thought that was an offense to your Diksha Guru. We're still learning, but we've, I think we've learned everything, but the culture hasn't caught up yet. So we're still, we're still moving towards that culture where the position of Prabhupada, the position of Diksha Guru, the position of, position of Siksha Guru, the Sangha, everything is very clear to everyone so that it is, that we have this extremely healthy atmosphere that everybody's satisfied with. So, Krishna Karshini says, what about devotees who cannot function well without personal presence and personal service of our guru? Um, if, if, that's, if that's the case, and there were many devotees, uh, that was the case with Prabhupada. They had so much personal association, they depended on it. The, the liability there is that you may be hit hard, you may be hit the hardest when your guru goes. So you have to be able to develop a relationship uh, through service and instruction and separation as well because that's going to be the only relationship you have once he leaves. And so if you're not prepared for that relationship and it was entirely based on personal association, you'll have a really hard time. And uh, some devotees had such a hard time that they couldn't maintain their Krishna consciousness. So that's... Uh, that's, it's very important, if that is your situation, to be able to cultivate a deeper relationship through instruction and service in separation. Otherwise, you'll, you'll be one. Um, it's gonna, it'll be very difficult for you. It, can't, it could be. It could be. I don't say it will. I don't want to say exactly you'll have a problem, but I say you may not be prepared for it. You may not be as well prepared for it as you would be if if you were more connected through separation. And, you know, the guru is always encouraging you, saying nice things that inspires you. Well, are you going to be inspired when he's gone and he, he, he's no longer you're going to get that every month? that's going to be a problem. And for some Prabhupada disciples, it was definitely a problem. After he left, they couldn't make it. They just couldn't. And so that's unfortunate. It's not what your spiritual master wants. Okay, another question from Chotir Mai. When I am close to Guru Maharaj, I feel totally stupid, incapable of saying one single thing that has any sense or interest. I'm so, so much more able to elaborate things when I am not close to him. 
Bill, I cherish so much his association. I was like that with Prabhupada. I just didn't say anything. Uh, his association, I cherish his association every time it's possible. I would like to be a tiny spot of his shadow. Remain permanently stupid. <laughs> you can be stupid, but don't act stupid. That's the, that's the aphorism. In the context that the end of life is the possibility to develop a new and better life, or even uh, to Krishna, in the case of saintly people, shouldn't we make the effort of understanding death as a liberation for that person? The set, yes, sadness is ours because we miss the presence. Yeah. You know, if an advanced devotee leaves, we know they're going back to Krishna or will engage in service in their next life. So there's really, there's really no loss other than the loss that we feel because we lost their association. Okay, it's time to remove the sun from my microphone. Hold on. Okay. Christe says, for almost a year now, I get this very strong feeling in my heart saying, I miss you, Prabhupada, but I never met him. Could, could mean that you actually have met him through sound. Could mean that you actually met him in your last life. Vijay Lakshmi says, but for pure devotees, they would like others also to go back to Godhead. Of course. That's all they think about. Krishna Karshani says, maybe I'm wrong, but it seems that we are often more attached to Guru as a person. <coughs> We're not that much attached to instruction. <laughs> it's related more to women who are often in love and sentimental. Well, um, I, don't think, I don't think it's bad or I don't think it's wrong. I actually think it's in some sense wrong not to be attached to the Guru as a person. It's a personal relationship. And we were all very attached to Prabhupada. And it was an inspiration, <clears throat> for sure. But what you are trying to get at is it can become a liability if that's all there is. So if it's balanced, it's very powerful because it becomes your impetus for serving. Out of love, you want to serve him. Um, you know what's in his heart. You know what he wants, and you want to fulfill that. And it's very personal. And, and you have a personal relationship. And he inspires you. But if that if that becomes if that gets in the way of being able to hear his instructions, which you essentially need for your spiritual life, then that turns into Maya. So it is something to be aware of that it can happen, that you think you're attached to the guru, but you're not actually attached to what they want you to do. Now, sometimes you can't do what they want you to do. It's just you want to do what they want you to do. It's not you're just attached to them. But um, sometimes you can't. But sometimes you can and you don't, and that's a problem. So, yeah, so you have to be a little careful. It's what we call like the sentimental attachment. What we call, you know, people, ja, Prabhupada, Prabhupada, you know, and then... After Prabhupada leaves, they go off and s smoke some marijuana. So that kind of thing we've seen. You know, this like extreme sentiment for Prabhupada, but not the ability to follow the instructions. So Prabhupada said, if you love me, you'll follow your you'll follow my instructions, you'll follow your vows and so on. That's Prabhupada wanted to, you know, to make sure that we understood that love was not just a feeling, but it was also an action. So love is a feeling, love and an action, it's very good. Love is a feeling only. It's not. It's it can be troublesome. Love is following the instructions only without a feeling. It can even become impersonal. So you see in the shastra, there's so much appreciation of the disciple for their guru. They're always saying, you know, my guru is everything. You know, how could I live without them? So you know that should be there also. If that's not there, it kind of becomes like impersonalism. My guru is just there till I become God, then I get rid of him. You know, my, well, my guru is just there because he gives good instruction. Other than that, you know, I don't feel anything. Bhakti is, a, is an emotional process also. So I think it's just a question of balance. But 
if it's only if it's only only just um, I'm in love sentimentally, that's a danger sign. Or I wouldn't say danger, but it's a sign of concern that there's there, we're out of balance. Okay, I think I have to get off in three minutes. It would be easier if Prabhupada was here to maintain unity and clarify theories, definitely. Now we can only trust in his pure disciples that serve to honor him. But of course he can't be here, so like I said, um, even if he stayed another 20 years, we'd still be confronting issues. Maybe it wouldn't be as difficult, but it would still be. It's the nature. I wonder in the continuity of times when Prabhupada disciples also depart. That worries me. And I, yeah, you're all. You all will be when the Prabhupada disciples leave. You'll you'll be like us. You'll be forced to mature. Honoring and following the message of the Guru, giving continuity to his work, isn't also also more important than how much time we are in his presence. Yeah, his Prabhupada was only with his gurus like six times. Um, a lot of devotees are operating yoga studios for teaching bhakti and consider themselves separate entities than ISKCON. Is that against Prabhupada's instructions? Um, that's a question that's hard to answer in one minute. If they're teaching what Prabhupada's teaching, no. They're not, they may not be legally incorporated as ISKCON because they don't feel maybe ISKCON understands their preaching strategy or wants ISKCON to interfere with it, but they're not against the GBC. And so if you're not against the GBC, you know, they're going to do what, ultimately do what the GBC wants. That's what, what does it mean to be in ISKCON? You, you're working with the GBC. What does it mean to be outside of ISKCON? You don't work with the GBC or some somewhere in between. If I'm inimical to the GBC, yeah, then I'm really not a member of this kind. If I'm not inimical, if if I can work with them in some way, uh, maybe not legally overseeing my projects, but you know, for the mission, then it's still this kind. Position of guru is really challenging. Not everyone can be a leader. I believe a guru is always being scrutinized by others. As a role model, he has to be a role model, yes. Has to maintain himself in a humble position, yes. Though having a lot of people around him, yes. Serving him, yes. I can't click on what you want to say, but I can say, yeah. Uh, a lot of people surrounding and treating him like God, Prabhupada was perfect. All his work example attitude is why he managed to inspire any herd till today. We still feel we will do what he asked. Yes. Uh, one day now, every time I feel bad, but it's kind of disappointed. I just ask myself, what Prabhupada will ask for me? Perfect. He doesn't want you to go. What would please him? And this is like the amen question that clears all my doubts. Yeah, that's, that's beautiful. You see a problem and you ask, what would Prabhupada want me to do? Is there a proper trust where the money is used for retired disciples? Uh, not that I know of. There's some discussion of creating a um, facility for retired disciples. It's And a, a, a building is supposed to be built in Mayapur for them. Uh, yeah, and these are things that are being discussed. Um, maybe database online. Go. You have to hit contents. Database online may be different. I remember Lakshmi Mani said that Prabhupada disciples thought Prabhupada will never die. I think it's the same uh, with our spiritual masters, of course. There's a young lady devotee in temple here in Italy that left everything after two months. She got to know Krishna consciousness. It's been years now, and she is the outmost devotee, but she doesn't have any spiritual master because she says... She says, like the internet connection, it, all the time my spiritual master is through the Prabhupada. I don't need anyone else. Um, that's good, but she does need someone else because just tell her what she said is absolutely true, but there's only one small detail. Prabhupada said you should take a, be initiated by a living guru. So if Prabhupada is your everything, then you have to do what he says, and that's what he says, and that's that guru will only help you become closer to Prabhupada. Prabhupada's service to the last second, biggest lessons, we now focus on service and his mission. Yes, do what he did. 
Um, when a poster is made, advertise a lecture by pure devotee, Prabhupada's picture has to be bigger than the disciple. Um, at least uh, as per GBC. Um, I think so. On the website, for sure. I'm not about posters. Is that is also for sure on posters? Uh, these things are not always known to everyone. Amazing way to put the topic. We're all in a boat and all... Th what is the point to be considered? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think it's a good example. Mm. I feel closest to Prabhupada when I try to preach. Yeah, because you're spreading this movement. Okay, I have to go, everyone. I'm going to end and I'm going to join the Zoom. And I don't know if the Zoom, if it's advertised. If it's not, it's just go to Lachua Temple website and you can probably figure out how to get there. But I think uh, Radha Priya may have advertised it. And they expect me there now, so I'm going to go and we'll see you soon. Hare Krishna. Jai Prabhupada.